Hello to all of our congregation and friends and listeners and collectively all under the sound of my voice. God bless you. This is April the 25th, 2021. And our lesson is number eight out of unit two of the Faith Pathway Study Guide entitled Prophets of Restoration. Prophets of Restoration. And this Sunday's lesson, lesson eight, is entitled Overcoming Losses and Brokenness. Losses and Brokenness. Our devotional reading, Lamentations, the third chapter, verses 22 through 33. Our background scripture, Lamentations, the fifth chapter. And our printed passage is Lamentations, the fifth chapter, uh, verses 1 through 22. And our key verse is, Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Renew our days as of old. Our lesson's aims are, Understand why the writer of Lamentations pleaded with God for the restoration of Israel. Sense the writer's feelings over the oppression of his nation. Pray for and engage in the restoration of broken relationships with God. And... Again, our lesson is divided into three parts. The first being titled, Pleading for God's Mercy. And then our second section is, The Wages of Sin. And our last section is, Pleading for Divine Restoration. So, we have pleading for God's mercy, the wages of sin, and pleading for divine, defi divine restoration. Now, uh, one of the things which uh, should be cited at the very beginning of our lesson is the wording of unit two it says prophets of restoration and the function of the prophet was to foretell things that were to happen in the future and the way that women and men and children would know that the prophet was for real and that the message that was conveyed by the prophet was of God is because what the prophet spoke, if it did not happen in the time of the prophet, it came true in God's time. And then the people knew that the prophecy was for real. And so when we look just at the wording of the unit two, prophets of restoration, since prophets foretell that which is to come, then the blessing of the lesson is at the very beginning because it says restoration, meaning God intends to restore what he started. So we want to keep that lifted. Um, uh, another factor uh, right from the beginning is our devotional reading. And 
Although many of the verses in our lesson uh, just kind of direct us to the, the pain, the agony, the empathy, the suffrage that Jeremiah is undergoing, uh, realizing the condition, the circumstances, and the, uh, the uh, situation that has befallen upon his people and the people of God. But our devotional reading uh, brings us uh, a, a glimmer of light, even by recognizing the atrocities and the, the, the discourse and the problems and the pitfalls and the suffrage and all of the dismay that fell upon uh, Israel. When we look at the devotional reading, it says, <clears throat> verse 22 of the third chapter of Lamenta uh, Lamentations. And it says, Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, the soul to the soul who seeks him. So, as we indulge into our lesson, uh, we should be mindful of the fact that the restoration was granted to the people of God. And restoration is still available and granted to those that sincerely seek the Lord out. So now, our lesson has uh, a uh, word uh, which really uh, uh, somewhat brings us into one of the lesson's aims uh, because it says, uh, since the writer's feelings over the oppression of his nation. And that word that we have is elegy. It has been cited in the commentary of our lesson that uh, a word or a title that was fit for the mood of the Book of Lamentations uh, is elegy. And uh, the definition of the word elegy uh, is a poem. It's a writing expressing sorrow and disdain. Uh, it even speaks of wailing and mourning aloud. And uh, it is used to describe uh, that which is dead or the pain one feels for one who is dead. So when we look at the overtones of the book of Lamentations, we are witnessing the agony and the pain that Jeremiah feels when he recognizes the condition and situation of his people. And what causes uh, this uh, spirit of pain for him is remembrance, remembering how we used to be and who and what we have become. 
And therefore, the key verse says, Restore us to yourself, Lord, that we may return. Return to what? Return to how you once had us. Return to the place, to the protection, to the provisions, to the grace, to the mercy, to the healing, to all of the fulfillment of life that once was ours because of you. It says to renew our days as of old. Remove us from the present situation that we face and restore us to the glory that you blessed us with. And so when we look at the beginning of our lesson and it says pleading for God's mercy, let's first of all look at how Jeremiah describes or how Jeremiah screams and wails out in torment because of what he sees. It says, remember, Lord, what has happened to us. Remember, Lord, what has happened to us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to foreigners. We have become fatherless, our mothers are widows. We have to buy the water we drink. Our wood can be had only at a price. You gave us pastures. You gave us large areas, acreage of trees. But now we can only purchase the acreage of trees that you granted to us. Now we can only purchase that at a price. Those who pursue us are at our heels. We're constantly running from the enemies all around us. We are weary and we find no rest. We submitted to Egypt. You told us not to, but we did anyway. We submitted to Assyria just to get enough bread when we already know that you are the bread of life. Our ancestors sinned and are no more, and we bear their punishment. We are the offspring of disobedience. We are reaping the seeds that were sown and the reaping is upon us. Servants rule over us and there is no one to free us from their hands but God. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the desert. We take a chance just to provide the, many, the menial things for ourselves because of the aggression that's directed towards us. Our skin is hot as an oven. Now, the King James says our skin was black like an oven, but when an oven is overheated, it begins to turn colors as it is consumed by the fire. And it says we are feverish from hunger. 
Now, when you are pleading to God for mercy, you identify and you list and you itemize all of the atrocities and all of the calamities that are upon you because you want God to fully understand where we are. But let us also reflect upon this. We don't have to tell God about our atrocities. We don't have to list the calamities that we face. We don't have to itemize it because God already told us, had we obeyed Almighty God, the great I am, God already said, if you obey and follow my guidelines, these things will not happen. But if you choose to fulfill your own desires, if you choose to follow your own ways, if you choose to do what satisfies you, Rather than the one who created and made you. These are the things that you will see. And so first Jeremiah pleads for God's mercy. And he identifies what they are experiencing. So that God would understand that right now. We need mercy. Look at what we are beholding. Look at how we're being treated. Look at what is happening to us. We understand we've made a mistake. We understand we chose to go in another direction. We recognize that we disobeyed. But Lord, right now, we need mercy. I know we need to repent. I know we need to change. I know we need to clean ourselves up. But right, clean ourselves up. But right now, we need mercy. And then it tells us that the wages of sin. And because sin has no limit. There's not a shut off to the depths of sin. Uh, there's not a cut off point. Um, just like there is no end to the love of God. That it is unlimited. There is no end to the depths that sin is. And the unrighteous one will take us to. And what scripture says is, is that again, Jeremiah is identifying, look at our condition. Look at what has happened to us. It says women have been violated in Zion. Zion being the house of God, where God dwells. Virgins in the towns of Judah. Judah, the southern kingdom of the nation of Israel. Prince have been hung up by their hands and elders are shown no respect. Young men toil at the millstones. Boys stagger under the loads of wood. The elders are gone from the city gate. The young men have stopped their music. Joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. 
Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our hearts are faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim from Mount Zion, which lies desolate with jackals prowling over it. Jeremiah is speaking to us. When we ask, how do we come out of this condition? How do we return to the status and the people we once, we once were? Well, if we look at what Jeremiah cites, it gives us some inroads into how we return. Because it says the women have been violated. And we're seeing all across the earth that women are not held in the place and honor that the woman was created in. And many times we look at what the enemy is doing. So Jeremiah is focusing on what has happened to those who have overtaken Israel, to the foreigners and how they're being treated. And of course, in battle, when wars and one group of people overtake another, there is total disrespect for the women, for the elders, for the young men. Because now we have conquered you, you people who once was so adorned and admired and feared because God's hand was on you. And everyone saw the blessings of God just flourishing among you. But now that you forsook the God who blessed you, now no one respects you. And so these atrocities that we face, that Israel was facing, women being violated, young women, elderly women, middle-aged women, women as a whole being disrespected and taken advantage of because we forsook the protection that we once had. And so how is it restored? Well, first, we must stop violating one another. We can't talk about what foreigners and oppressors and others are doing to us when we are doing the same to one another. If we really want to send a message, if Israel really wanted to send a message to the oppressors, to the foreigners, and to those who overcame them, then first of all, clean up our own house. Stop disrespecting our women and give honor and respect to our elders. It talked about how the elders have gone from the city. Well, not just the oppressors and not just the foreigners and the cap, the uh, capturers ran the elders away, but our lack of respect, our lack of honor for what the elders could teach us, the wisdom we forsook that and now the elders are not available because they feel disappreciated they feel as though they have been discarded 
And until we welcome the wisdom that God placed in our elders, acknowledge it and accept it, they will not be respected by anyone outside the house when they're disrespected by everyone inside the house. The work of the restoration is upon us. God is still available. And as I read at the beginning of the lesson, his mercies are new every day. Now I wanted to address a couple of things and then we'll close. At the end of our second section, The Wages of Sin, the commentary reminds us that Proverbs 14 and 12 says that there is a way that seems right, but its end is the way of death. There is a way that is advertised, that is marketed. As though it is right, but its end leads to death and destruction. Now, when we speak of this, many times, uh, although we see death at an all time high all around the world, but we're not just speaking of elimination and we're not just speaking of people uh, being physically removed. We're talking about a death among people that are walking, living, talking, breathing. You don't have to be physically dead to be experiencing the acts of the dead. And so what Jeremiah pleads for is the restoration, it was a spiritual restoration. The commentary talks about that Jeremiah played that we would be a restored people spiritually. And then, after we've been restored spiritually, then grant the physical restoration of their homeland. Because Jeremiah realized that the loss of God's blessing was more tragic than any material loss. Now, I want to just talk about very shortly, very briefly, about the spiritual death and the physical death. Because we can be alive and well and be spiritually dead, but look like we are living when we are really just surviving and existing. So many times uh, we talk to one another and just in casual conversation, we say things like, hey, bruh, hey, man, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm just making it, bruh. I'm just hanging. Hey, I'm just trying to survive. Hey, you know, it's your world. I'm just living in it. Just our common uh, uh, courtesy and greetings signifies that, hey, uh, things are not as well as they appear. We don't hear in our uh, biblical context that when the men of God approached each other, they said, Shalom, peace be unto you. And the response was, and unto you be peace also. But our conversation, our greeting denotes and identifies where we are, what is our mental state of being, what's our consciousness saying. So now 
I wanted to just uh, identify uh, just a, a, a little thing to bring us into this spirituality uh, that we're speaking of, uh, because the last part of our lesson is pleading for a divine restoration, talking about to return us uh, back to who we used to be, Lord. You remember, uh, uh, restore unto us the glory of the blessings, the the status, and, and when we speak of status, we're not speaking of uh, material wealth. Let's be clear about that. Uh, remember Matthew 6 and 33, which says, And seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto thee. A lot of times... Uh, we're putting the buggy in front of the horse. We're seeking things without godly intervention. And that's why so many of us, uh, unfortunately, God wants us to be blessed. God created all of these things. God even said that, yeah, all of those things will be added unto you if you seek me first. So God intends for us to be cared for. God said he would provide all of our needs and God has done just what he said. But what we have to reflect upon is what are we doing? Now, I wanted to just lift this here, and this is uh, out of the uh, book of Isaiah. I want to distinguish between spirituality and just ritualistic practice. Now, th this, this is from the 66th chapter. Of Isaiah, and um, it's it's it starts off by the Lord uh, reminding us how great I am is. It says that heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hands made. So the Lord says, But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit. One who is of a contrite spirit is one who is remorseful. One who is agonizing over the dismay and over the evil and wickedness that, that exists. It says, On him who is poor and of contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Now here is the distinguishing part. It says, he who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. And just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so will I choose their delusions and bring their fears on them. Because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. And they did evil before my eyes, and I chose, I'm, I'm sorry, and chose that in which I do not delight. 
they decided to do the things that were an abomination unto God. And what I want us to lift and understand here is that people have become so accustomed with going through the rhythm, just going through the flow. People had just gotten adjusted to all I got to do is just go take a lamb and sacrifice it. All I got to do is just go kill a bull and that'll compensate for my wickedness. All I got to do is just bring a grain offering and that'll cleanse everything that makes the slate clean now. All I got to do is just go burn some incense and that'll get me in. That'll cover up what I did last night, last weekend. You know, I'm all good. I just got to go through the motions. All I got to do is just follow the ritualistic practices. I don't really have to change myself. I don't really have to improve. I don't really have to make any adjustments. All I got to do is just go through the practices that say I'm a changed person. I don't really have to be transformed. I just go through the acts. And many people are just substituting religious ritualistic practices as though that is being transformed. And then we wonder why we don't experience the true power of the great I am that I am. Because we're caught up into organized and structuralized religious practices. But spiritual cleansing is yet on the list of things to be done. And so, another text in Matthew 5 and 3 says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Are you wailing in your spirit because of the wickedness that you see? Are you dismayed when you see the fallen humanity? We have allowed humanity to become inhumane. And now inhumane is more popular than human. Inhumane is more popular than, in, uh, than being humane. That which is ungodly is more popular than that which is godly. And yet, the book of Psalms at the 19th chapter, the 19th number of the book of Psalms and the 7th through the 11th verse tell us that the law of God is perfect. God's testimony is God's testimony, God's testimony is sure. It makes the wise, oh God, God's testimony is so profound. It makes making the wise things seem simple. It says that the statutes of the Lord are right. The commandments of the Lord are pure, not contaminated, not constrictive, but they enlighten us. They are God's expectations of us. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. All of the identities, all of the acknowledgments of God, it tells us they are more to be desired than gold, sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. So as we Look at Jeremiah 
explaining to God, pleading unto God. Lord, look at us. Look at who we've become. Look at where we've fallen from. But we know that you are still all powerful. We know you haven't turned from us. We've turned from you. You said you called out to us, but we didn't answer. We were preoccupied. You said you spoke, but we didn't hear. You said we we like we we degraded our relationship with you. We discredited it. We did things with your eyes wide open. And we had no shame in our practice. But we're still pleading because we know the power of restoration is still within our reach because you are a God that is long-suffering. It is not your will that any of us should perish. Well, I hope that something that was said shared some light on this lesson. I hope, I pray that God has allowed his word to convict and compel us and to make sure that we understand what is at stake. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.